here. Excited to hear what you have to say. And we've got some good questions for you. Good luck with that. <laughs> At the end of the uh, session, we're also going to let you guys ask him some questions as well. So uh, start thinking about what you're going to want to ask. Can we start us off with these? Sure. Um, what is our first question? Oh, yeah. So we have, um, we did some checking. We checked some of your older interviews so we wouldn't have to ask questions you've already answered before, and we could go a little deeper that way. So we learned that your favorite carrier, character is Aria. Big surprise. I guess that's not a surprise. Is that still true? Of course it is. Of course, of course. OK. Well, I had to ask. I had to ask. Um, what's it like for you seeing the transition she's made in the show? Because when you were, when you first worked with her, you know, she was, 11-ish and... 13. Uh, 13, okay. And, you know, just kind of learning to sword fight. And now she's this crazy, badass killer. What's that kind of like for you, like seeing that transition? I mean, it's, it's amazing. I mean, it's, it's amazing because it's so exciting to see her journey from this young girl. I mean, and it's, it, you know, I mean, the same thing probably happened with... Uh, well, definitely happened with Harry Potter, is that you watch people growing up in front of your eyes and you know that that weird thing between uh, the actor and the character is blurred because of it you know uh, so so that is what I find so exciting but it's conflicted because you know as with all great uh, stories the 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 thing that's set out which is she will get revenge on the people that killed her family is fine initially but because Game of Thrones messes with your loyalties and makes you go hiya <laughs> uh, messes with your loyalties and on the one hand goes look at Jamie Lannister what a bastard he is and then on the other hand turns him into a character that you uh, well it's <laughs> It's, it's a matter of debate, but I love Jamie Lannister now. He's my second favorite character. And, and I love him because he has had an amazing arc, you know, from being someone that you, you just go, no, you don't want to have to, 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 to you know, he's, he's set up as someone that you're not gonna like and eventually becomes someone that you're incredibly conflicted over. And, and he's still, you know, the Lannisters are still on Arya's list. So, you know, what happens if she ends up killing him? You know, that, that could be all vice versa. Those things are, are exciting to watch. And also her revenge is not pleasant to watch either, either because what you see is someone who, in a normal kind of like action movie, what you'll get is, is go, yeah, you're gonna get um, uh, John Wick kind of killing those, <laughs> those fuckers who killed the stars, right? Right? <laughs> Quite rightly so. Right? But that's the kind of movie it is. It's kinetic, it's, it's about something else. But with Game of Thrones, it's like, no, you're not supposed to want her to kill everyone because revenge damages you. So not what just are your other hopes people. for Arya? What's that? What are your hopes for Arya then? Are that you she, stays she, alive, she stays alive, but I don't know whether that is possible. Do you think it's possible that she might take out the Night King? No. 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 Okay, let's move on a little bit. I How can't elaborate on that at all, <laughs> uh, for obvious reasons. Glad know, but you know. Have you worked with any of the other Game of Thrones actors on other projects? I know that there's, they've been in other projects with you, but maybe you didn't interact. Uh, not really. Uh, I'm trying to think, but not really, because, you know, the closest I got is probably Kate Dickey, who's Woo! been in the Star Wars universe, but we're in completely different movies. So, and that's no. And Christie as well as yeah, in exactly. Force Awakens, so, like you guys wouldn't have interacted. No. Yeah. Uh, I mean, we barely did on Game of Thrones. In the first season, we all stayed in the same hotel. And, and in the days when, believe it or not, the, the cast was smaller, <laughs> Can you imagine that? In the first season, yeah, it was small. Well, could fit everyone now. <laughs> well, exactly, you know. I mean, you can't have them all in the same place at the same time. The ego, the physics of ego, would mean that some kind of uh, catastrophe would happen. You know, it's like in Ghostbusters. Don't cross the streams. Don't cross the egos. No, do not put a whole bunch of actors in the same town at the same time. So they stagger us now. You know, we're all staggered. 
these are the kind of things we don't know about that when shows get bigger, the kind of things they have to do behind the scenes. <laughs> That's why the budget gets bigger. <laughs> so you have had a role, though, in two of the biggest franchises you know, today, like Star Wars and Game of Thrones. Uh, one, what was the difference between those big productions? Obviously, Game of Thrones was in season one, so it was much smaller. But I had a more specific question about what the process was like in costuming for both of those characters in The Force Awakens. Was there any back and forth? Did they just give you a costume and be like, here you go? Or did you say, no, I want to do this? It's a really good question. It's a really good question because um, obviously with Game of Thrones in the first season, we knew what the story was. You know, we all got uh, all ten scripts. We had a read through of the first six scripts. Uh, before we even started filming on the first season. Um, so there's a lot, you know a lot more. I don't think it's the same now because everyone just gets what they need to know and nothing else. And sometimes they throw in kind of like just made up scripts. That they, <laughs> like fan fiction, just to throw actors off the set of where, where it's going. But. But, so we knew, we knew, and so you do have, you do have, you know, the talk, and you have the talk about, do we shave the head? Yeah. Do we shave the hair? Um, and make him bald, and we had a lot of talk about that. I, I mean, I didn't have anything to say about it, except they asked me, they said, do you mind, David and Dan said, do you mind if we shave your head? And I went, yeah, of course I don't mind, it's fine. You know, a part of why I like acting is transforming myself, you know, that's, that's the whole fun of it. Um, but eventually, I think uh, it was George Martin said, it's, it's not necessary for him to be bald. I wrote that character and described him in such a way so that he would look different and be different to the hairy bastards of the North, <laughs> right? <laughs> That's why he's written as small and big-nosed and bald. But he said, but you've got all the other kind of weird qualities, <laughs> like the opposite of Sean Bean, and that's good enough, right? <laughs> so, so that was fine, so I kept my hair. Um, but with Star Wars, we didn't even know what we were playing. Yeah. <laughs> so you get JJ, because I didn't audition, right? Because all he wanted, he was just kind of, because Nina Gold, who casts um, Game of Thrones, casts starts to all the Star Wars movies. Uh, JJ was just looking for some people for the, for the, the, the Maz's castle. Yeah. And uh, so he, he said, oh, you know, get, you know, would Miltus like to be part of it? And I was like... Yeah, of course, but well, no one had a clue what we were doing. So up until turning up on the day of filming, I had no idea what was going to happen. So you go for your costume fitting and you see this amazing, um, oh, I can't show it to you. I've gotten a great photo of actually, listen, come over to my, if you can find me today and I'll show you the photo. But it's, uh, and of course I, I wasn't allowed to take a photo of it, but as soon as someone left, I was like, <laughs> I was sad, right? So, so this beautiful drawing by the designer of my character, and he's in this kind of, uh, it was all retro, uh, so it, you know, it kind of went back to the basics of uh, making all the, the rebels or the, the, the smugglers kind of, uh, you know, kind of retro fitted with cost costumes. So my, my kind of weird sniper, uh, thing was, was uh, what they used to wear in the Second World War, the Russians used to wear in the Second World War, and they were like almost like tents that you wore. So they, they did that, and, and then there was, uh, you know, the kind of the, the, the orange plasters on the hands and on the nose, and, and then the tube that goes up the nose, and he said, I don't know about the tube, I don't know about the tube, and I was like, what are you talking about you don't know about the tube? You've got to do the tube, <laughs> don't do the tube that goes up your nose. He said, I don't know how we're going to do it. He said, just put it up the nose. <laughs> just put it up the nose, right? So I insisted on the tube going up my nose. This is Star Wars. It's like, you know, that's the kind of little detail that I like, you know. That's the detail that you, you look for. Um, and still, no idea of who I was playing. I had a gun. So, of course, they do that thing where they come in, and they do this with the lightsabers, but they also do it with the armory. When they come in and they go, so which... Uh, weapon do you want? And they give you a whole choice. And you're going, oh, I don't know about this, this is a bit too big. There was one that was like the size of me, and I was like, please let me have that. And he, was like, he did actually have V on them. that. And he was like, it's like, no. <laughs> 
hello. There's three of us in this room. <laughs> so, so, um, so, so that was fun. All of that was fun. And, and of course, seeing how close they got to the drawing is, is really exciting. So it is very different. Uh, mainly because one you know about and the other one is, is you do everything in, in the dark, you know. I have a question kind of related to your having to shave your head or whatever, it's kind of personal to me. Do you find that women find you more sexy now that you have a little grey in your beard? <laughs> I'm the last... Ow! <laughs> As you can see, I'm not very good at kind of those kind of questions. I think that wasn't a sword. <laughs> um, uh, I'm the last person to ask, but, but, you know, for a long time, I was one of those actors that, that um, up until about, kind of into my, until I kind of hit 40, I would go up for things. Is that like a couple months ago? Shut up. <laughs> I, I, would, I would go up for things where they wanted someone who was in their 30s, you know, close to the 40s, uh, things in The Mummy and all those kind of movies, and uh, playing weird e Egyptians covered in tattoos. And they'd look at me and they'd go, but you look like a baby. I was, I looked really young for a long time. And then, and then I kind of hit 40, and then everything fell apart. <laughs> and, and, and amazingly, I kind of grew into my age, and I was like, oh, this is fine. And so when I got, went grey, I really liked it. In fact, I'm not going grey fast enough for my life. I, I want to be Can't like what you wish I want to, yeah. Uh, I wanted to be like my my grandfather, who was like he had a full head of hair and, and it was just white, completely oh, yeah. white. But it did change. I don't know about the attractiveness, but it did make me much more uh, employable. So that was good. Well, I so that's a that's a thing to everyone. It's right. Aging is not a bad thing. Try, I believe that. Try. So, you told us that you would have shaved your head for Syria. I read that you also auditioned for Varys, which oh, yeah. would have required you shaving your head yeah. for sure. And so I had a question, if you could play any <coughs> other character in the show, not Syria, you cannot answer your own. I know you have loyalty. Who would you want to play, male or female? Braun. Braun. Yeah. Who would win? Syria or Ron? Syria. Yeah. Be <laughs> a good fight though, but yeah, we agree. Syria. Um, okay, so another related question to that. Um, you said that uh, you had um, worked with, um, you had been back uh, years ago before you had done this role, you had some experience with sword fighting and you've learned quite a lot more. But I also recall a comment you made where you weren't sure if you could be a teacher because um, you're maybe you're uh, you like to be you're you know, easily distracted or you just always notice other things. You're kind of that was your answer. You really have done your homework, haven't you? <laughs> yes, I that's just, what we do. I just kind of do these interviews and I forget that they're recorded and then I people look at them and go, "But you said it. You said it." And I was like, "Oh, I don't know. Either I was really drunk or stoned. Or I don't know." But, uh, but yeah, I did say that. Yes, I did. And He's I know why. teacher. Yeah, so that's what I was going to say is you, now you, you teach these lessons here at the, at the cons and the people are glowing about them. They're, they Sold fill up maybe. really fast. They sell out really fast. So yeah. How yeah, I'm you... so sorry about this. It's because we, we, I don't know why in a hotel that has so many rooms they could only find me a really small room. <laughs> I have no idea. I've got a horrible feeling that they... Take it outside. <laughs> very, very hot, but, very, you know, next time. Getting hot with Syria. <laughs> yeah. 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 I'm so sorry, you haven't answered the, 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 I haven't no, answered the question. Carry on, what was, what was actually the point of the question? I suppose the point of the question would be, there were, there's two, two points. One would be just how has that been in this, as an adjustment period, you learning to teach and how do you feel about that now? But also, as far as roles, you know, Syria is this kind of classic, mentor role in a lot of ways and is that have you done other kind of mentoring roles no i haven't and it's a shame because i would love to play a character like that again. haven't yet yeah, yeah. yeah but it's it's tough there's a weird thing about uh about making movies is that did, did yoda have a long lost son maybe <laughs> 
or, or, or twin brother. Um, the, the weird thing about uh, being good at a specific thing in movie making is that no one gives a shit. <laughs> it's true, no one gives a shit. They're stuntmen for that stuff, right? And, and the reality of, of making movies and TV shows is that you don't have enough time to learn the choreography. I think one of the reasons why when they sent the breakdown, the thing that describes what the character is to an agent that then gets passed on to an actor, is that they specifically said they wanted someone who had sword fighting experience. And as I've said many times, that doesn't make a lot of sense to me because sword fighting is something that's kind of illegal nowadays. So anyone who's practicing that is doing it underground and pretty much on the show streets. show up the cops are there, they're like, gotcha sucker. Busted, yeah. busted the illegal sword fight. Right? Exactly. Busted. Get him in jail. Um, so, so, so they wanted that because they knew that they, they, I mean, the thing is about the character of Sirio is that he doesn't have a lot of scenes, and in the scenes he has to kind of come across as someone who is born with a sword in his hand and, and kind of convey that. And it's one thing to play a character that has a kind of, you know, you get to kind of get to know them and get to see what they do, and then you can throw in some kind of Hungarian stuntmen dressed, <laughs> dressed as the character and you won't really mind. But everything that I, you know, the, 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 the lessons, which is what they were with Arya, had to have a sense of authenticity. And of course that's uh, um, a terrifying thing to an actor because as much as we, we enjoy what we do, we, we are very aware of there is a limit to what you can convey on screen because the camera is here. So anything that you, you, you do or you don't do is very obvious. So, so I guess that's why they asked for someone who had experience. And luckily I, I did have experience. I'd worked uh, at the Royal Shakespeare Company and done a lot of dueling uh, there and I loved it. I had a background as a dancer and that's why I could kind of uh, do it quite, uh, not easily, but that my, my brain was able to process it. Anyone who dances, you know, you understand that your brain can process stuff sometimes better or less well than other people. Oh, so that was true for Maisie as well. She has a background Yeah, she's, she, she, that's what she was doing at the time when we were filming. Was, Someone give me a sword. Doing, uh, <laughs> do, no, because there's probably someone here with one. Um, and uh, the, and so, so, for the first time, I didn't have to lie about something that was on my CV. So when they asked me and they said, do you have experience? I went, yes, I, I do. Uh, but I, I knew that I needed to, to, to find someone to mentor me and do the homework. And, and I found this amazing man called William Hobbs, who uh, was in his 80s and was kind of my Syria Pharrell. He, he was the one who cooked up the vocabulary of what the, the, the water dance was going to be like. Um, and that was a fantastic experience. And I worked with him and Maisie stunt double, and then Maisie wasn't there. And then I flew to, to Northern Ireland and I taught her what I'd been learning. And the director and the producers walked in and while we were doing it, just going through it, and they were like, oh, well, that's excellent, that's the scene. We're just watching you do the scene. And I went, well, not really. I'm just telling her what we just did. He goes, no, you've got to do that. Do the thing. Do that thing on, in front of the camera. Um, but I, I, I really love that. But the thing is about being good at something like that is that it, there isn't a lot of need for it. You know, how often do you... I mean, you see plenty of things nowadays with people with sword fights, but even on Game of Thrones, no one has time to rehearse choreography. So you'll get the actors coming in, they'll do the scenes, and they'll just get the, the stunt doubles to do the fights. And, uh, but the thing that I'm very proud of is that both me and Maisie made a pact. We were like, we're going to do this all ourselves. I saw my stunt double. He's, uh, he's a guy that I know. He's Ginger. And, uh, and he was in a terrible wig. There's no disrespect to the people who, you know, do that stuff on, on, on Game of Thrones. But, uh, but I was like, there's no way this guy is going to be doing the, the back of his head, no. So we, we made a pact that we were going to do it all ourselves. And it was, you know, that, that was, you know, I always believe that the challenge is the exciting thing. Yeah, you know, doing things that are hard are more exciting than doing things that are easy. Do you have any other pacts? 
<laughs> I have lots of packs. I make packs with, with actors I work with all the time. It's the only way that keeps you sane when you're working on something. It gives you focus. So you've obviously had to prepare, you know, for all that sword fighting. Uh, what are some other crazy or, you know, maybe intensive, time intensive things you've had to learn how to do, prepare on how to do for stage work, film work, any of your projects? Or was that maybe the most intensive? I mean, doing thing. I mean, doing theatre is 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 very intense. Uh, the the weirdest thing is when you do things which aren't necessarily the normal way you watch theatre. So I did a production of uh, Crime and Punishment by Dostoevsky, and we did an adaptation of it. And the kind of a light comedy, right? <laughs> <laughs> you wait till I tell you what I'm up to at the moment. That's a that, yeah. Then we're going down some rabbit hole. But um, the, the, in, in this production, um, we were doing the story, but we had recreated this uh, disused abattoir under the grounds of Clerkenwell in, in the oldest part of London. Whoa. We'd recreated St. Petersburg. There were little, mo you'd kind of go, it's really dark, okay? I had to stand up to, to describe this. So it's an installation. You walk down the steps into the darkness, and you, people go in like maybe three or four at a time. You'd go down and you walk through, and there'd be snow down the corridor, and you'd turn another corridor, and then you'd go down, and you'd walk down this very, very dark passage, and at the end of it was this little model of a train going through Siberia. And it was like so beautiful, and it was like a little miniature, as if you were, looking at it from space, right? And then you'd come out from that, and then you'd walk in, and there'd be a porn, uh, porn broker shop. <laughs> and it literally was, you'd open the door, and there'd be a Japanese woman in there trying to sell you stuff, literally trying to sell you stuff, and people would part with money, and she'd just give them tat, right? So people were really into it. And then you'd kind of follow her around. And if you were there at the right time, because the performance lasted three hours, if you were there at the right time, you'd witness the murder. But you wouldn't be in the room. She'd close the door, but you'd watch it through the window. And you'd watch her getting bludgeoned by, by uh, Raskolnikov, Raskolnikov. Then, if you carried on, you'd come to a police station where there's a whole bunch of police officers and me playing uh, the detective Prefiri up in kind of looking down. And then we'd do these interrogations with the guy who's playing the character. The audience at any time can be this close to you, That's right? Close. This close. So you're having a really intense, it, 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 you know, interrogation with this guy, and there'd be someone this close staring at you while you were doing it, or sitting in your chair that you're supposed to use them. And, and that, that is so distracting, and it took so much concentration just to not, um, be, be interrupted by someone. Because, you, you know, the whole point is that they, you'd, and also you'd have to make notes. So as a, de as a detective, I had to make reams and reams of case studies of <laughs> crimes I've already uh, uh, solved and have them around so that at any point, if an, au if an audience member wanted to open a drawer and read something, it had to be real. Wow. It took so long, and I nearly had a nervous breakdown doing it. But it's still, to this day, one of the most uh, exciting and uh, challenging and, and, and fulfilling jobs that I've ever done. It took a lot of focus and concentration. It took a lot of focus and concentration for me to not kiss you just now. <laughs> That's actually like, that's actually a great segue to another question we had, which is we were we were wondering about. Um, obviously, intuitively, we would all kind of understand that there would be differences between the way a movie production is made or a TV production and a, and a theater production. But I think a lot of us don't know what those differences are specifically. Maybe you could speak to some of those differences, and especially with examples like this of, of what we just saw. That would be a great example, but I'm sure there's some more. But the the normal way of doing a play is that you get a bunch of actors together and you get a director and a designer and all the crew and all the team and you usually have a script and uh, you spend a bit of time understanding what the script means so that you're all on the same page 
And then you rehearse it, you kind of block it, and you stage it, and you know what the set is going to be like, and then you just do that for four weeks, or five weeks, or if you're at the RSC, eight weeks, because it's Shakespeare. Um, and, 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 and then you just perform it, and you perform it, and you sit there, and you're quiet, and you watch it, right? <laughs> and don't make any noise, and you turn off your fucking phone. <laughs> And, um, and, and that is the normal way of doing it. But as someone who has done everything from opera to circus in my time as a performer, that, I find that as much as it can be very fulfilling, and sometimes you do some fantastic plays that way, new plays, um, I'm much interested, I'm much more interested in the, in the stuff that is a little more challenging, that is, is almost like becomes an event. It becomes something that you will go and see and that you have as much input into it as we do and that that to me is the essence of what all storytelling is you know as far as i'm concerned what we do is just simple 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 storytelling as much as i could just stand here and tell you a story that's all we really do when we do it on tv or on th in theater and so if you ever lose sight of that that's where you kind of end up not really uh, connecting. Because the bottom line has to connect. You have to care. You have to uh, have some kind of opinion about it. If it ever makes you want to just sit there in the dark and fall asleep, then you're really not doing, doing, <laughs> doing your job. So, so to me, that is the most important thing. So I've often, often... <laughs> So I've often looked for work that is, which is uh, what I would consider out of the ordinary when it comes to seeing things, you know. Yeah. So that's what you like. So what are you watching when it comes to TV, movies, you know, I guess any good plays or productions you want to do? And out of what you're watching, what are you just dying to be in? God, so much. Um, I, I want to do a science fiction. That's what I really want to do. Like, like proper, like a TV yeah. science fiction. You gotta get in the expanse. Amazon just picked it up. I know. Get I was so there. excited when they, because I really like that, and I'm really glad that they, that Amazon had uh, picked it up. Um, so, so that's really good. Um, so you could probably get. To um, so I, I, so science fiction is really what I want to do. What, that's what I really love watching. Mm -hmm. uh, what have I been watching recently? Um, uh, what was the last thing I watched? The last thing I watched was probably Stranger Things 2. Which was great. Really great. Uh, really horrible watching Sean Astin being eaten. Oh, God! <laughs> rubbish at this. I've done it so long and I still rubbish at doing it. Uh, oh, the faceless people have just... What's that? It's been out for a while. I'm sorry. Anyone Excuse else me. Uh, and um, uh, and uh, Altered Carbon and the OA. The OA, which I thought was so uh, amazing. amazing. I don't quite... I'm not quite sure about doing a second part, but... Uh, Jason Isaac assures me that it's it's definitely good, but um, but I thought it was so perfect that I thought that that is perfect. It doesn't need another series. It felt like it was complete in itself. Um, so so those are the things that I'm watching at the moment. Uh, awesome, lots of great sci-fi yeah. there. Are you watching Westworld? Humans? Oh my God, yes, I love Woo! Westworld, but I haven't seen the season. Yet. I haven't seen it. We can tell you all about We're it. We're going to spoil you now. <laughs> there's, a man, there's a man in black costume walking around here. Yes. Yeah, I love Westworld. Fantastic. All right. So, uh, there's another question I feel like I've been going for a minute. I can go on. I wanted to ask, I suppose, uh, a, a few years ago you were asked what A Song of Ice and Fire books you've read, and you said books one to three. And so I assume that's all you've read, but I thought it was possible that you might have gotten back to it or might 
be more spoiled? People through conventions, people might be asking you about things from those books. I, I no, I, I haven't read any more. Did you my, read up to book three because you're like maybe he comes back? <laughs> 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 no, I, I read up to book three because I remember David Dan saying uh, um, the the. Uh, the Red Wedding, can I, can I say that? Yes, yes, yes. Oh, God, right. well, you just, just don't know. I mean, you wouldn't be here, would you, if you had either not read the books and hadn't seen the show. I mean, there's still people who get dragged along. Yeah. You haven't, that's fine. That's true. But yeah, so I remember David Dan saying that the whole reason for doing the series in the first place was because they wanted to, to put that on the screen. Um, so I read up to that, to that point. But I, I, my main problem is that I love reading, but I have to spend so much time reading stuff based stress, on yeah. work. And so every time, and because there is no such thing as an original idea anymore, mm -hmm. everything is based either on writings or on books. So you can't get away from it. So I, I have like reading lists every time I do a job, and that's literally all I have time to do. So yeah, I, ha I haven't done that. Although I did read Annihilation. Oh, cool. Before cool. I saw the, sh the team, and, and I loved that, by the way. I thought that was fantastic. It was great. I loved it, too. Uh, I read the book, um, and I, I was reading it, and I was, I was uh, excited because I had to make sure that I finished it before it came out on Netflix. And it's an amazing book, and if you haven't read it, you've got to read it. It's one of the best science fiction books I've read in a long time. Yeah, it's re it really is and very good. And it's a trilogy, good. and I haven't read the, the next one yet, but... Yes, you got something yeah. for when you're between jobs. It's really fun. easy. Yeah. It's really easy. It's one of those fantastic books which kind of a lot happens in it, but you still kind of don't really know what the fuck is going on. <laughs> <laughs> and sometimes that would be a terrible thing, but actually it's really, really good. It's really good. So a, a few of the things that you brought up that you were watching or projects that maybe you would want to work on or, show, you know, have had... Streaks of darkness in them. Game of Thrones maybe has a streak of darkness in it. <laughs> but you're working on something now that maybe is all darkness. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's all darkness. Uh, there's a, an amazing director, Catalan director, uh, called uh, Calixto uh, Beato. And he does a lot of uh, amazing work. Uh, he does a lot of opera. And he's known as the uh, Quentin Tarantino of the opera world <laughs> because he, he seems to be obsessed with sex and violence. And he even told me, because I'm working with him at the moment, he even told me that, that he was approached to, to put uh, The Hateful Eight and turn it into an opera. <laughs> and he was going to direct it. But he, went, he was like, I just think this is going to be, it's not even going to be... Uh, uh, a, a good bloodbath. It's just going to be a bloodbath. <laughs> and so he refused to do it. But he was, you know, they really wanted him to do that. So this is the guy that I'm working with. And, uh, and his latest project is um, a really interesting thing. Uh, that's what I'm leaving tomorrow in the afternoon to get back because I've got a performance of it on, on Tuesday in Luxembourg at doing the international festivals. But it's a piece called um, the uh, String Quartet's Guide to Sex and Anxiety. <laughs> and uh, it's all about depression and suicide, oh. which is not a barrel of laughs. <laughs> and I have to admit that I haven't really told my friends to come and see it because uh, I don't, it, it's, it's very challenging and it's really hard to do because it's very personal. We're, we, it's, it's made up of a string quartet who are world-renowned heat quartet, and they uh, performed two pieces, one by Ligeti and one by Beethoven. The Beethoven is full of anxiety, but compared to the Ligeti, it's like a relief. Because Ligeti feels like uh, you're listening to someone having a panic attack, if you can possibly imagine that. But what's interspersed amongst all of the, 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 the movements of the, of the classical music is these amazing bits of writing by people like Anne Sexton and David Follin. I uh, know uh, we used to have a lot of his work, but unfortunately the widow withdrew her, her uh, David Foster Wallace. Uh, uh, we were going to do some of his writing. But they're amazing pieces of, of work, Stig Dagerman, um, and they've written about 
their own experiences with depression and anxiety. Uh, everything from the reality of dealing with a, a, a profound mental illness to our struggle, our existential struggle with what the fuck is going on and why are we living in a world that we don't understand anymore. That, that is the, the, the spectrum of things that we do. But it, it, it's very uh, harrowing, it's very personal, and all the pieces relate to something that's happened in our lives as four actors. And that it, it's, it's awful to perform. It's so hard. It's the hardest thing I've ever, ever done. Because it's so... Uh, he, the director isn't interested in acting. He's interested in this thing, this shared experience. So it, when we perform it, there's no real set. But we literally are sitting this, I mean, even closer than this to you. And we just tell you these, 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 these experiences. And even though they're not ours, if we didn't write these experiences, they relate to us. And people are, I mean, it's challenging, you know? It's not easy to watch because it, it touches on things that everyone really has suffered with, whether it's anxiety, panic attacks, the anxiety of being, um, of, 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 of being in a sexual relationship that you're not sure whether you are uh, compatible, everything to uh, the, the suicidal thoughts that, that, that took most of the writers that were used, their lives, they, they, they most of them killed themselves. Um, all, of, all of those things. And so, to me, as you know, if you've met me before, I raise money for a mental health charity and I will be doing that here as well. So if you come and see me and you, you want to contribute, uh, my team will be around. But um, it's very important. It's very important for many reasons. It's very personal to me. But, but doing this felt like it was what, it, it was like a, a, a serendipitous thing to end up doing because it, it felt like this is where I, I needed to be. But people are devastated by the end of it. But I'm interested in that. I'm interested about how do we touch an audience so profoundly that they don't forget it. They don't just leave and then get on with their lives. But something, even if it's a little moment, will just resonate and stay with you. And you will, not, you, you will always remember it. And, and I think great art should do that. I have a, a, a saying. It's not my saying, but it's the thing that I, I believe in passionately, is that Art should disturb the comforted and comfort the disturbed. And that is, that is what I think art should do. And if we do it right, that's kind of what we do. And it can be found even in the most ridiculous ways. You know, when we watch Star Wars, we have that thing, you know? It makes us remember that we are either children and that, that the things that, that trouble us, you know, we can uh, put ourselves in a different place sometimes. And, and art can do that for us, so yeah. Well said. Um, can we get things ready for some audience members to ask questions now? We're a little short on little time, short but we've got a few, we should definitely have time for I told you, I never stopped talking. Yeah. <laughs> I'm impressed we got through as many as we did, <laughs> So if you have a question, uh, line up right here, right there. Wait a second. Everyone's shy. <laughs> <laughs> there are some folks. Brave soul. So are you really Jack in a car? <laughs> I did, a, I did a, a, a convention with Tom uh, in, uh, it was, I think it was last weekend. Wait, are there pictures? Because we've never seen you together at the same time. <laughs> so I did the convention with him, but no one ever saw me and him in the same place. <laughs> and they were convinced. They were convinced it was a like a, it was a setup, but I literally bet I never saw him. I saw him from a distance at one point, but he never said hello. Uh, so poss possibly, 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 possibly. Hi, Lilith. Um, I was just wondering. Um, you said you started a um, mental health charity. I was just wondering what inspired you to do that because that's like really amazing that you did that. Um, I didn't start it. The, the, the ch charity is called Mind. And it's a British one, and I have found out that there are others in the in the states. So when when I'm, I'm trying to get 
so, so that I don't just raise money for stuff back in the UK, because I know these things are, are regional. Uh, I did find that there are a couple of charities in the States which I'm trying to get in touch with so that when I come to the States and raise money, I'm raising money for them directly, so the money goes directly to people in America who, who need it. But, um, but yeah, it's, a, it's, a, it's the biggest uh, charity in the UK uh, based on mental health and they raise money to, to fund telephone lines and help people in crisis and give them advice. So, so it's a small thing, but it's, it's really important because there aren't as, and I'm sure it's the same here, but in, the, in Europe as well, that, that, that our understanding of mental health is, uh, it, we're, we're catching up, but we have a long way to go. We're doing this play, right, um, the, the anxiety play, and I, I begin the play by reading this, uh, this extract from a 17th century book, um, The Age of Melancholia. And the things that this man talks about from the 17th century about how to deal with mental health uh, or how to treat it, hasn't changed, <laughs> hasn't changed for over 400 years. And, and apart from the bloodletting, we don't do that so much anymore. <laughs> you know, when they used to put leeches on you because they thought it was a humour in your blood. We don't do that anymore, at least well, as far as I'm aware. <laughs> so that shows you how little we've, we've really got to understand it. We have a lot of uh, medical terms for it, but as far as of, of what we really need to, to do to help each other, uh, not so much. Thank you. Pleasure. Hello. Um, I was wondering, when you do those really intense emotional um, pieces, how do you decompress after that? How do you kind of not let it carry on to like your daily activities and just... Good question. When we first started doing it, it was really hard. Uh, I always find myself feeling really antisocial because the, I mean, every actor uh, approaches this stuff in a very different way. I, I begin the show with a, you know, four-page monologue, so I have to really concentrate, right? I have to really concentrate. And so I can't be backstage going, oh, have a great show. Me, that's bullshit, right? <laughs> and, and, and so I really can't do that. So do I, sta afterwards. I stand in the corner like this <laughs> for at least 15 minutes before I go on stage, like that. I, I can't speak to anyone. Um, but then afterwards, because it's so cathartic, kind of because I've got it out of my system, it's much easier to be honest. Surprisingly, I, to, I, I have to admit, it was really, I was very surprised that that, that happened. But, Actually, going through the process of doing it is is how I decompress. That's wonderful. <laughs> Thank yeah. you. Hello. Hello. All right. So I understand you are very busy doing all of your things, and I wanted to know if you had any ideas of what you think might happen in the last season of Game of Thrones. <laughs> well. <laughs> Well, God, I mean, anything can happen. I reckon, um, it's trouble is, if I, whatever I say, someone will kind of uh, think that it's because I know something. <laughs> but I have to qualify this. I have to, I have to, just to just troll everyone right here. Jamie's going to die. Arya's going to die. Uh, Daenerys is going to die. John has to go through some intense transformation. And, and turn into something else, almost probably turns into a dragon, and kills, I mean, who knows? Um, uh, so, I, don't, I mean, I don't know. What I'm really interested in, though, is, is all those things that I mentioned earlier, whereby characters who we love, for whatever reason, come into conflict, and usually with other characters that we love and the fact that that will make for incredibly dramatic TV, going, no, what, no. <laughs> that, that's the kind of thing that, that, that is so good about Game of Thrones. And ultimately, I really hope, and I think, I think this is the case, that it won't be at all what you think it's going to be. <laughs> Ooh, yeah. Okay, well, I think we have time for one more. 
Good morning. Good morning. So since the glorious Roy Patrice is no longer with us to do voiceovers and you're looking for future work, <laughs> perhaps you might consider voiceovers for Audible Books for, I don't know, an upcoming book series such as Winds of Winter? <laughs> hey now, that's a thought. Oh my God, I'd love to do that. I'd Have love to do that. Have you done any um, audiobook, audio work at all? Like, obviously, you've only, only, um, the only thing I've really done, because the thing is about, uh, about acting, is that um, in America it's a little different, but that's because actors are very well repped. So what happens is that as an American actor you'll have uh, an agent for theatre work, and you have an agent for, to, for film work, and you have an agent for voiceover work, and, and they're very organised, and, and so actors do that, right? And that's what they, that, what, that's their arsenal. But in the UK, we're all a little bit like casual about it. So you're like, I'm just an actor, what do you mean I need a voiceover agent? You know, because then you have to do the tapes and you have to kind of do the things and you have to know someone who can, you know, all of that I find so hard, all of the organization. That's what I really need as a PA. Anyone wants to do it for free for me? Oh my God. Yeah, well, come and have a word with me because I really need someone to help me. Um, so, so I can concentrate on doing the acting thing, but it's all the other stuff. And really, you need uh, someone who will, who will represent you on that stuff. But the only thing I have done is that I was the voice of Gollum for the PlayStation, the official PlayStation. Oh, wow. So if you're ever playing those games from around, how long ago was it? Do you remember when those games came out? The official PlayStation. Lord. years ago, I feel like. Shut up. <laughs> Fifteen, fifteen years. years. Um, and uh, yeah, so I had to do all the voice. I had to do the voice of. I had to just basically do Gollum. I was. I lost my voice. I spent three days in a tiny little box. Going, <laughs> and I had to do all the ambient, all the the, uh, the the all the kind of incidental sounds like climbing up rocks and falling over and being stabbed. And it was yeah. So that's the only thing I've done. But it's a great idea, and I will mention it to my agent. <laughs> Thank you. Right, thank you so much. Yeah. If you have any other questions, please, you know, if you see me around, don't hesitate to ask. That's what I'm here for. So, unless I'm very busy. <laughs> thank, you very much. Oh, I'm busy. thank you guys for coming. Thank you. See you around.